a very warm welcome to each and every one of you to very reverend pt chandapilla 11th annual lecture i request uh, if any of you are standing outside to please come inside the chapel we are going to start the lecture with word of prayer may I now invite reverend lalboy hockep the chaplain of jmbc to come forward and lead us in opening prayer let's pray dear god heavenly father we thank and praise him for being with us this morning thank you father god for gathering us together here we pray the lord even as we begin our meeting may your holy spirit be with us help us and guide us thank you father god for bringing ren dr editorian nainan mr jacob vergis and all other we pray the lord even as they are here you be with them use them to challenge our hearts to strengthen and to renew in our commitment we pray once again and commit the remaining session of this meeting into your mighty care be with us and help us to glorify your name in christ jesus name we pray amen let us glorify god through singing this time jmbc choir will lead us in a time of singing i request the congregation to stand we're going to sing the song o oh god our help in ages past the song is printed on the final page of the paper that has been distributed seated now the principal of jmbc reverend dr prakash abraham matthew will come forward to welcome and also give the introductory remarks
Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Glory be to God. I greet you all in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and I praise God for God's unchanging faithfulness in the life of this the institution for the past 35 years. One of the established aims of my church was evangelization of India. The leaders of the church felt that we need to have a missionary Bible college to train young people who will carry the gospel into different parts of India. When the church completed 25 years of its ministry in 1987, this dream was materialized and it was very Reverend P. D. Chandapilla who played a key role in establishing Jubilee Memorial Bible College. Jubilee Memorial Bible College is a silver jubilee project of St. Thomas Evangelical Church of India. Very Reverend P. D. Chandapilla, a visionary whose vision and commitment for the propagation of gospel are undeniable factors for the existence of Jubilee in the past. Not only Jubilee, he was a visionary to take the gospel to the North Indian states of our country. We have the Hindi Belt mission of our church because of his great vision. A person who was part of UASI and was the first general secretary as well, several other ways, his contribution for the propagation of gospel in this land. My knowledge about him is very limited and I am inadequate to speak about him. I remember when I was planning to go to UBS for my theological studies way back in 2001, I met him in our church convention along with my dad's brother. He was a pastor in our church and he is no more. Together we met him and my dad's brother told him that uh, this young boy is going to UBS for his studies. And immediately he took a sheet from his notepad and uh, written some lines, not a printout, I mean typed one or something like that, but immediately he written a few lines and asked me to send this uh, to UBS. After four years of my study, in 2006, the church asked me to come to Jubilee. When I came here in 2006, Chandaplayachan was bedridden and he was staying in one of the rooms uh, in a building that we are now using for our school. I came in the middle of the month of May and the classes will begin June 1st week. Actually, the person who was taking care of P.T. Chandaplayachan uh, Mr. Jairaj, he had to go ho home to his home in Kerala urgently. And the then principal and the administrator told me next two weeks my assignment is to take care of P.T. Chandaplayachan. He was bedridden and I had to go to that place, that room and stayed with him two weeks to give him proper medicines on time which was prescribed to him and feed him and I remember those days and several other students at that time, that time in Jubilee. One or the other way, I mean, they were assigned some time to take care of him and we all uh, was uh, part of this great responsibility. A man who had a different lifestyle and it influenced the generations. Once he stated like this, great men are not who have great words. Great men are those who have great life. I praise and thank the Lord for great men like him. Great men and women of God. Who not only had great words, but had different lifestyles. With these words, I would like to welcome all of you 
to this uh, very reverend P.D. Chandapilla 11th annual lecture. Our resource person today is Reverend Dr. Idichiriya Nainan, who associated with Chandapilla Yachin for a long period of time. Dr. Idichiriya Nainan is presently serving as the chairman of ESAF Foundations. Earlier, he served as a professor of New Testament in Syax, Bangalore. He also served as the former principal of uh, IPC Theological Seminary, Kotem, and served as the first general secretary of ICPF as well. He was part of USI, and he has contributed through his writings as well. A few of his works are in progress, and we pray that the Lord may continue to enable him to do things for the glory of God. A person who involved in teaching and training for several years, and uh, I, on behalf of JMBC, would like to welcome you, sir, uh, to this uh, annual lecture. I request uh, the treasurer of uh, the Board of Governors of JMBC and JM Trust, Mr. V.V. Cherian, to come forward and welcome him by putting a shawl. We do acknowledge the presence of uh, uh, Dr. Nainan's wife, Mrs. Carol Nainan, and uh, we welcome you, madam, as well uh, to this program. And to give a response to this lecture, we have uh, Mr. Jacob Varghese from UESI. Mr. Jacob is the general secretary designate of uh, UESI, and he has been in the staff team of UESI for several years. Mr. Jacob and Mrs. Jesse, they served as uh, staff workers in different places of North India. Presently, they are based in Chennai, and he is leading the communication and networking uh, department of UESI. And uh, myself, uh, Jacob Chan, and uh, Jesse Andy, they, we were contemporaries in the seminary in UBS in Pune. Our prayers are with you, sir, as uh, you will be taking up the new responsibility as a General Secretary of USI, and I'm glad to welcome you to our midst this morning. Uh, may I request our Dean of Students, Mr. Sam P. John, to, to come forward and uh, honor him uh, with a shawl. Yeah, we have two persons uh, who will be sharing their memories about uh, Chandaplayachan. One is uh, Mr. John Mathai, the former National Director of World Vision India. He also served as a visiting faculty here at uh, Jubilee Memorial Bible College, and uh, uh, he associated with Chandaplayachan for a long period of time. We welcome you, sir, uh, to our midst this, uh, this morning. We have uh, uh, Reverend James Ratnaraj, another person who associated with the channel Balayachan. Uh, he was the former uh, General Secretary of UESI, and he is the founder and director of uh, Discipleship Renewal uh, Ministries, and we welcome you, sir, uh, to this lecture. And Reverend Dr. John M. Prasad, the former principal of Jubilee Memorial Bible College and currently serving as the director of... Uh, Peace Studies, Madras Christian College, and we welcome you, Achan, to our midst. <laughs> we have Reverend Leslie Nagarajan, General Secretary of uh, India Church Growth Mission, is with us, uh, and uh, he often visits, uh, I mean, he's a visitor to our campus, his uh, students, I mean, students from ICGM are studying, we welcome you, sir. <laughs> Uh, pastors from St. Thomas Evangelical Church of India, friends from UESI, and board and uh, trust members. 
graduates of Jubilee Memorial Bible College, faculty, staff, students, and community members of uh, Jubilee, and uh, friends who are watching this program online. Uh, we welcome all of you to this uh, very Reverend P.D. Chandrapilla 11th uh, annual lecture. We really value your participation and your presence. We continue to seek your prayers and support as uh, Jubilee uh, moves on to achieve the vision that uh, Chandrapilla Yachan and several others together, the vision that uh, they have set for. And I would like to end uh, with uh, Achan's statement even if India says they do not want us, we will say we want India. All languages, every tribe and all groups and all people, they belong to us and we are debtors to them in Jesus Christ. We are concerned for them all. We want to carry their burdens and concerns and their destinies in our hearts. May God bless all of us. Now may I invite Mr. John Matai, the former National Director of World Vision India, to come forward and share his experiences and memories of very Reverend P.T. Chandapilla. Respected Achins, honorable guests, both on the dais and in the pews. Thank you. The faculty of JMBC, the members of the board, the trust members, staff, students of the Jubilee Memorial Bible College. Greetings to each one of you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to participate in this 11th Very Reverend P.T. Chandubulla annual lecture. When I got the invitation, I said, yes, I'll be happy to participate. And then, of course, the principal asked me to say a few words when I come here, remind, remembering my association with this great man of God. I then asked him whether there is a role like this in a purely scholarly talk and a presentation and a discussion. He said that there is surely a place in this, and so here I am. The program sheet tells you memory lanes. And so I go back in time to remember the times I did spend with Chandra It all started off as a personal family association with the family of Chandra Achin. Then we used to call him Chandra uncle, Dora auntie, then Dora Kachama, and Susan being very close associated with my parents and the rest of us those days. In fact, Dora Kochama was my Sunday school teacher, helped me walk through initial faith lessons those days. That's where it started. When we were due to get married in the year 1980, I was surprised to find that my father-in-law, to be father-in-law then, and Achen were schoolmates uh, those days. And of course, that must have been another tick mark as to why he must have allowed me to marry his daughter. Now, in the year 1980 is when Susan, who's here with me, and I got married. We got married in the Emmanuel Methodist Church at Wepri in Chennai. The wedding was conducted by the then 
Reverend P.T. Chandrapala, who was the vicar of the St. Thomas Evangelical Church. And we had actually hired the Emmanuel Methodist Church because STECI Chennai did not have a place of its own. We were gathering together in a rented hall, and it was too small to contain all the guests for that wedding. English translation of the Malayalam service was something new at that time for the St. Thomas Evangelical Church. Possibly it was among the first such wedding conducted in English by the STCI Sabha itself. And there I saw in Piti Chandrapala Achin a man for meticulous detail to make sure that nothing was missed. All the nuances were taken care of even in that translation. And I'm talking about memory lanes and those are where my interactions with him were. Later, for a brief while, I was a vice president of the St. Thomas Evangelical Church of India Madras Parish when Achin was our vicar and therefore the president and we had close interactions with one another. Later coming on in time, I joined World Vision and as was introduced, uh, I'm formerly uh, working, worked with World Vision India as the national director. I called him and told him, he was in Delhi then, and I said, uh, uncle, and I still call him uncle, uh, I have been given this assignment to join World Vision to be the national director. And I expected him to be very thrilled and very happy for me and for the entire family. What he said to me was, John, is World Vision Christian? Is World Vision evangelical? Those were the questions that he raised with reverberated in my mind, years, all through the time that I served in that assignment. Such was a man, never lost, lost his focus as to what we need to be in this country, in this world. Chandrapalachan was a man of vision and of course a lot of things that he did but where I was involved in some form is all that I'm going to speak of. First of all, I want to talk about, we spoke about the St. Thomas Evangelical Church of India, Madras Parish, worshiping in a rented place. And we were looking for a place to purchase. And when that new site was found, it was a little too much to be able to handle with the finances that we then had. It is then that Chandrapalachan came up with this great concept of the Sushyasram on the one side and the church on the other. And therefore, we managed to get that location. And today, I've been in touch with people from the Evangelical Church, Madras Parish, who tell me what a wonderful thing that has been to be able to build up the ministry in that part of Ananagar, a man of vision. Secondly, of course, most importantly for all of us, I'm going chronologically, is the JMBC, the Jubilee Memorial Bible College. When Achin those days was looking for a place for this college, and he of course spoke to a lot of, many of us in the St. Thomas Evangelical Church of India, Madras Parish, he looked for a place and many of us looked around in Ananagar and places like that and thought, of, thought this may be the ideal one. One day Chandrapalachan came and said, I found a place, it's in Ayanjeri. And we said, what? Where is that? Urapakam, where is that? He managed to sell this idea to us. As a man of vision, and we are talking about many, many years ago, today, look at the way this has grown. This place has grown. This college has grown. There is no way we could have done anything of this nature if he had listened to us and taken up a place in Anana, we had very limited vision. We could not think beyond our noses. He found this place. Not only he identified this place, of course, as a founder of this college, but he also did a lot of succession planning. I remember how uh, 
we have now, of course, Bishop Thomas Abraham, then Achen being the first principal. We had Reverend Dr. C.V. Matthew, who of course later became the principal, being a subsequent principal of this college. We had Varghese Philip Achen, who was handpicked by him to be here as a dean. We had Prasad Achen, who is here now with us, who also he picked out from UBS and said, you would be there. We have Abraham Chako Achen, who of course now is the bishop, who also was brought in by there, Sunny John Achen, who was a former principal from here, Mr. O.T. John. All these were people that he handpicked in terms of succession planning, not just finding a location, but getting this all the way through. Such a man of vision, JMBC. And I want to give you a third, and which is very less known around, but he needs to be given credit. There's an interdenominational Bible study that goes on in the city of Chennai. It's been there across the world called the Bible Study Fellowship. And I remember in early 90s, Chandrapalachan said that I, we want, there's a group of people I met went to the US, they want to start this Bible Study Fellowship in Chennai, in India, and there's a person by the name of David Pipes who is supposed to be coming down, and what Achen did was to get him a visiting visa to be able to come and teach in the Jubilee Memorial Bible College. He used what was available for him to start this whole interdenominational Bible study in Chennai and now spread across the country. It is going very strongly now. There are people who are here who are also participating in this. The Bible Study Fellowship actually owes its start also in some way to Reverend P.T. Chandrapala. So I just spoke about three aspects where I were involved of this man of vision, the Sishyashram, the JMBC, and the BSF. Before I close, a personal anecdote about how he was a simple man, simple living lifestyle. Of course, all of you know his dress that he wore, a kurta, and I remember I met uh, one of one of the big supporters of this college then, who now has gone to be with the Lord, a person by the name of Mr. Ron Barber, in Colombia. And he told me this, and I'm just repeating what he said in my words. He, after all the meetings that took place with Chandrapala Chin and what he did in the college, he told him, Chanda, uh, what you're wearing looks very nice. Would I get one of those. And then I believe Chandrapala Chin, the night before he left, handed over his used juba or kurta to Ron Barber. Subse and this is what Ron Barber told me. Subsequently, Barber met the president of the Columbia Bible College, Dr. McQuilkin, and told him, you know what Chandra has done? He has given me this. He says, Ron, you don't know what you have done. He carries two kurtas. He comes out here. He washes one at night, wears one the next morning. And you have robbed him or taken him one of those. And he felt very bad. He called Chanda and said, Chanda, how do I pay you? And he said, I am continuing to pay for it in the supporting that I do for Jubilee Memorial Bible College. I have not completed my payment for that kurta. That was a simple man that he was. I think I'm done. Uh, let me just close with this logo of Jubilee Memorial Bible College, which is there, which has the words in his steps. And so when Chandrapala Achin and me, we had our conversation with each other. Before that, one more thing. On our 25th wedding anniversary, Susan and I, when people do all sorts of things for their wedding anniversary, we decided to come over here and spend a day with Chandrapala Chen, who was convalescing in a room out here. He could hardly hear us. He listened to us. There was no smile. There was nothing. But it was such a blessed time that we had with him on our Jubilee wedding anniversary. Let me get back to the logo. In his steps is what it states there. 
and in the discussions that I had with Chandra Palachin, I've come here and spoken in to, the, to the students here, taken classes, and I've said this often, but here is an opportunity for me to say it again. Jubilee Memorial Bible College, J-M-B-C. Chandrapala said, Jesus must be central. J-M-B-C. That's the man, that's the calling that he had. And I trust and pray that God will encourage each one of us to follow his footsteps as we go along. Thank you once again. Thank you, John Mathai, uncle. Now may I invite Reverend James Ratnaraj, founder director of Discipleship Renewal Ministries, to come forward and share your memories of very Reverend P.T. Chandapilla. The principal, the board members, and all other dignitaries, I bring greetings from Discipleship Renewal Ministry to all those who are seated here. I thank God for this great opportunity to come here and say a few words about, uh, I call him as uh, Brother Chanda. <laughs> Chandrapala. So we were very close to one another. I'm a Tamilian. <laughs> he is from Kerala. Though we were from different states, we have maintained unique relationship all through our life. He had been my mentor. And he was my prayer partner. And he was very active here. And then he was more or less bedridden. Even at that time, I used to come here to meet him frequently and get his advice. When I want to start this Discipleship Renewal Ministry, I consulted with Chandapala <coughs> and invited him to my home. And he gladly accepted and then came to my house. I told him all the things that I had in mind. Then he told me, whatever you have told is very lofty ideas. But what is the ground root, ground root realities that, should, that you should understand? Grassroot realities. So that opened my eyes. It is not enough to have theory, brochure, and the explanation about our aims and ideas. But to put into practice these things, to find out whether it is workable, whether will it produce effect in the people who listen and then the people who want to follow the high ideals of being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just I wanted to mention a few things about Brother Chandapula. See, my association started from 1968 or 69. I don't know exactly the year, either one of these. He was the main speaker in our TNEGF conference where I was involved with. So that is the time I meet him first, you know, with the dhoti and a kurta. <clears throat> I was surprised. 
whether this is the person who is the general secretary of a great movement of USI, which is mainly working among university students. But I have to immediately <coughs> change my own opinion and conviction about him. Because when he started speaking in the conference, he roared like a lion. <laughs> And then his words, very precise, at the same time very effective. It will penetrate the hearts of any person who hears that message. And therefore, I am thankful to God for my association with Brother Chandapula. Since 1984, I have taken a sabbatical leave I wanted to study something, how God shapes a person as a leader. That is the main question on which I was interviewing people. One of the person whom I have interviewed is Brother Chandapula. Then he was in Pune at that time. I stayed with him for two days. I know him very well while I was working in UESI. And therefore, in UESI, there were many senior staff, board members, and many others, and IFES movement was there. <coughs> IFES, IFES people were also involved. But amidst all these things, I had a question, <clears throat> who is the key person, the architect of USI? I was personally convinced that it is Brother Chandapula, <clears throat> with all his weaknesses and bright moments. I was very much convinced that it is Brother Chandapula. <clears throat> that is one reason <clears throat> I have chosen him <clears throat> as a person to be interviewed. Few things just I wanted to mention <coughs> about Brother Chandapula. At least three things just I wanted to mention. <coughs> See, it is the providence of God under wonderful plan of God to choose Brother Chandapula as an outstanding man to give the direction and the framework. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> framework for UESI, but also to this JMBC, Jubilee Memorial Bible College, and also St. Thomas Evangelical Church. Therefore, I thank God. See, looking at the background, his father was a poor evangelist, and mother always has suffered from depression. From this family, how the Lord can raise an eminent person? That is my question. The answer is, it is the supreme plan of God. And in the providence of God, God has chosen him right from the womb of his mother to play a very critical role in India through St. Thomas Evangelical Church, through JMBC, and through USI. That is what I wanted to say first, the providence of God. The second thing that I wanted to mention, all of you have mentioned about it, of his simple lifestyle and the servanthood character. See, he studied in America. Those who come from America normally establish some partners who will support him. I have noticed all the national leaders who are there in Chennai. 
they normally have ca their own car, but Chandrapala is having only <laughs> cycle. And he will have a pump also <laughs> to inflate. That he will have in the, the front side of the fork. Once I was talking with Sister Dora, <laughs> Mrs. Chandapula. She, my husband, <laughs> all those who come from America <laughs> are comfortable. <laughs> See, my husband, See, that is the simple lifestyle that he adopted. He wanted to identify with the poor people in India. <laughs> Otherwise, we can't evangelize India. <laughs> and he taught me what it means, faith and prayer. See, as I told you, he has got a simple servanthood character. I joined as a new staff. He was an experienced, eminent person, general secretary. Once I went out of my house for a tour. Normally, I undertake tour for about 10 days. And yesterday, I was talking to my wife. What do you remember about Brother Chandapala? <laughs> then she immediately said several things she shared to me. One of the things that she still remembers, he came to my house with a bag of the, uh, uh, these vegetables and other items <laughs> and leave it at my house. And she was telling yesterday, which general secretary will carry a bag full of vegetables and come to your worker's house and leave it there? Which general secretary will do that? <laughs> Her statement, several other things she stated. Such a servanthood character he had. He will go to the market and bring rice. See, there, is, there were attendants and others. He could have act, actually tell to his attendants and others to go to the market and get rice and other items. He will purchase all the necessary groceries and also the rice. One day I saw with my own eyes as I was sitting in the office, he carried that rice bag in his shoulders and folded his uh, uh, dhoti and carried it and went to his house. What a man. I'm surprised. I worked in a government. There is a hierarchy in government. The higher people will never respect the other person, one step below, unless they ask you to sit, you cannot take seat. That is how they give treatment to the higher officials. But I saw Chandapula was a totally different person. See, he, is, he was a trainer. He trained me and counseled me. When I was recruited as the new staff, I was asked to speak in an EGF meeting. And I, as the meeting, meeting began, see, many people started coming. The room was overflowing. Chandapala and others were given good seats, chairs, and important seats. And the, as the crowd was overflowing, <coughs> people were hesitant to come and sit on the floor. At that time, 
Shantapala was a great man, <laughs> general secretary at that time. He immediately left his chair and he came down and he sat on the floor. Then all the graduates, <laughs> no explanation, all of them came and then sat on the floor. This I have witnessed during the first year of my own training period as a staff worker. And what was he doing? At the end of the meeting, he came and congratulated me for the effective ministry that I have done. But at the same time, you know, he, used, he never wasted anything. Whenever some postage comes, he will take the cover, <laughs> cut it. That becomes three pages or at least two pages. He will note down all those things. My message he has carefully noted down. And also the mistakes that I have done. <laughs> and he was also correcting my English. He is very strong in, in his English. Vocabulary is very strong. Very great. The next day, he called me, James, I want to talk with you. <laughs> and then he gently advised me, corrected the areas where I have to make corrections. That is why I say that he was a mentor of me. See, we developed a friendship. There were disappointments he would like to share with me. And uh, this whole campus, when it was purchased, and also the ashram, which he developed in Ananahar. In all these things, it's not that he had money in his hands. He taught me what it means to look to God in faith and prayer. That is what he taught. So when I resigned my job, there is no government support. There is no increment or big support from the organization. There were frequent cuts in our salary because the flow of funds was irregular, sometimes very low. So we have faced all these things in the early days of our life in USI. He was not getting high salary. The salary which he was getting is like that of other staff. And then he told us, told me and my wife, look to God in faith and prayer for all your needs, the mental, needs, spiritual needs, and for your physical needs. That I cannot forget, and myself and my wife are still practicing the same thing which Brother Chandapala was practicing. For all the great things, he was only depending on God, even for the great need. Now it is all full of buildings. In the early days, I think there was only a small building was there. These buildings were constructed later on. The Lord blessed him to be a great blessing for the Union of Evangelical Students of India. And a great blessing for St. Thomas Evangelical Church. And a great blessing for JMBC. He finished his race. <laughs> and uh, we have to start our race and run the race. Fight the good fight of faith. And finish our race. There is a great need in India, poverty everywhere, 
ignorance everywhere, idolatry everywhere, and there is great opposition in the recent days. Amidst all these things, we should progress. So we should follow in his steps. I thank God for the opportunity and the privilege given to me to speak a few words about Brother Chandapilla. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend James Ratanraj. Now we will watch a short video about the life of very Reverend P.T. Chandapilla. I request the honorable guests who are on this stage to take seats uh, in front and return back after the video presentation. P.T. Chandapula was born on 18th March 1926 to Chiramanil Chandapula Thomas and Shoshama Thomas, who were working with Church Missionary Society serving in the tribal areas. As a child, he was told stories of great missionaries such as George Miller and Hudson Taylor. He saw his parents' faith being reflected in their daily lives. The family did not have a regular income, yet they lived by trusting in God to supply their needs. Despite their poverty, he was provided with education from Markama Boarding School and Gurukulam High School. He went to Saudi Arabia to work as a pharmaceutical nurse with a plan to earn enough money to study at a Bible college in India. Many people told him that it was foolishness to leave the salary job Chandrapula never turned back from his decision. God opened the way for him to study at Columbia Bible College, now Columbia International University, USA. Though he had opportunities to continue in USA, he sensed God's calling for him to minister in India and he returned to India in 1955. In 1956, he married Dorothy, a graduate of Calvary Bible School, Allahabad. They were blessed with a daughter, Susan Chandrapilla. Chandrapilla and Dorothy began to work with the student ministry called Union of Evangelical Students of India, UESI. Dorothy played an important role in supporting the ministry. Their home was open at all times for the students, graduates and staff. He worked 20 years with UESI and was the first general secretary of UESI. Chandrapula became an internationally renowned speaker. He was well known to several international ministers of his days such as John Stock, Ajit Fernando, Billy Graham and many others. John Stock remembered Chandrapula preaching at Nagpur to the students about the cost of discipleship. And because a communion service in which Chandra worked the students to drop like a seed in Indian soil so that it would bear much fruit. Several hundreds of students were there, and it was a very emotional time as Chandu concluded his address. Holding his Bible aloft, he cried out with a loud voice, Jesus Christ is Lord of India. Ajit Fernando, former national director of Youth for Christ, said about him. And Chandrapilla really showed us uh, an example of a true Indian um, with, uh, with not bowing down to other cultures and also the, the, the glory of simplicity. I think one of the, uh, the contributions.
contributions of Asia to the world is uh, an, a simple approach to life. In 1977, he became an ordained minister of St. Thomas Evangelical Church of India, STECI, and later he became its first Vicar General. He was also the first General Secretary of the Federation of Evangelical Churches in India. He was interested by the leadership of STECI with the task of starting a Bible College. In 1987, he founded Jubilee Memorial Bible College, JMBC, at Shishasram campus in Anna Nagar, Chennai. In 1993, JMBC was relocated to Urapakam. In 1999, the Hindi Belt Mission HBM of STECI was founded under the leadership of very Reverend Chandapilla to spread the light of gospel to the Hindi-speaking states of India. He used to say, even if India says they do not want us, we will say we want India. All languages, every tribe, all groups and all people, they belong to us. We are debtors to them in Jesus Christ. We are concerned for all of them. We want to carry their burdens and concerns and their destinies on our hearts. Very Reverend P.T. Chandapilla has authored several books. My Mother, My Teacher, The Master Trainer, Servant, India's McNally Tie, A Grain of Wheat, Missiological Issues in New Testament, Local Churches and Evangelism, Christian Leaders and Leadership. His wife Dorothy passed away in 2001. In his last years, very Reverend Chandapilla battled with his illnesses. On 4th December 2010, at the age of 84, very Reverend P.T. Chandapilla completed his earthly race and went to be with the Lord. Very Reverend P.T. Chandapilla carried the torch of the gospel and served the Lord faithfully in his generation. His lifestyle demonstrated and proved his message. His prophetic word holds true in all generations. It is not enough to have a message. You must have a life which validates and gives the credential for the message that you give for Jesus Christ. And that is why, in a sense, I do not want anybody to introduce me. That is why I do not want anybody to advertise me. And that is why I'm against any advertisement. Because I am my own advertisement and you are your own. Great men are not who have great words. Great men are those who have great life. In other words, the man God uses is a man who is a living message. A man or a person who has a communicating life. This is the combination of the life and the message. Many of us can give messages. Like the telegraph peon in our country, you can give emergency messages. And like the postman, we can give organized messages. It has nothing to do with him. <laughs> but then the message of a Christian is not that way. I think life is first before the message. This has been true in the case of the Lord Jesus Christ. This has been true in the case of John the Baptist. This has been true in the case of Paul the Apostle. This was true of all the Apostles. This was true of Moses. This was true of Daniel. This was true of all men of God whom God used and everyone down through the history. We have now come to the time to listen to Very Reverend P.T. Chandapilla 11th Annual Lecture and I warmly invite Reverend Dr. Idicharya Nainan, Chairman of ESA Foundation, 
to come forward and deliver the lecture. Respected Chairman and Board of Directors, Principal Dr. Prakash Matthew Achin, members of the faculty and staff, students and alumni, and well-wishers of JMBC, MAI also includes some dear friends who are here. Our beloved James Rathanaraj Annan, Dr. Prasad Achin, uh, Brother uh, Leslie Nagaraj, and several others, if I include, I may, <laughs> Uh, I may miss out somebody else. Well, may I greet you in Jesus' name. Thank you for the privilege of ad addressing you this morning. To me, it's an honor to be united with each other to offer thanks and praise to God for the life and legacy of the late Reverend P.T. Chandapilla. I met him for the first time in Nagpur in 1974 at the first National Conference of UESI. Meeting Chanda, as he was popularly known, who became the General Secretary of, the, of UESI in the year that I was born, became a life-changing experience. I liked his dress. He wore khadi, dhoti, and kurta, and a pair of rubber slippers. His English was too heavy with a penchant for puns, and his sense of humor was beyond my take. I laughed because others laughed. I had no clue why the whole congregation of 500 plus students and graduates burst into a thunderous laughter when he introduced John Stott as a bachelor who, whose main hobby was bird watching. You have not understood it, don't understand. <laughs> Bird watching was his hobby, but it is also a, a, a fine way of saying how, what some young people would like to do when they see beautiful women around. So his hobby was bird watching, but a bachelor, you know, so that was a pun, which, but we didn't, I didn't get it then. He challenged the UESI to become a grain of wheat like Jesus, as you have been reminded in the words of John Stott himself. He challenged the UESI to become a grain of wheat like Jesus, to allow God to cast us on the, social, on the soil of India, that we may die there for a great harvest. Something nudged me, not knowing that it was God's firm grip on a teenager. I too joined the more than 300 who stood up to receive the challenge. One of the persons who stood up that day was Bishop Dr. C.V. Matthew then a second year student at Yavatmal. May I say in thanksgiving to God that this message revetted me to the land and the people of India. Thanks be to God for gently planting hundreds that day within God's greater purposes for India. In 1976, Kerala EGF recommended my name to UESI National Executive to be sponsored for studies at UBS Yavatmal. A few days later, I received a postcard from Chanda. The recommendation reached after the executive committee met. So he has done the best he could. He convened the available executive, which decided to place my name first in the waiting list. However, he advised to do the entrance exam well, because selection was made by UBS from the panel recommended by UESI. In God's sovereign grace, grace, I was able to pursue BD studies at Yavatmal as a candidate sponsored by UESI. God used Achin in a significant manner to arrange for my doctoral studies in UK. While visiting him at his Ananagar residence in December 1980, he inquired about my future plans and offered to give a letter of recommendation to John Stott who would give the Bible expositions at the Tamil Nadu UESI's first triennial conference in Danish Spade, Salem. And my thanks to James Annan, who gave me a special duty that day. I was to go to Salem railway station 
and be a head load worker to carry his uh, John Stott's uh, suitcase. Uh, uh, Anna, thank you for that privilege <laughs> that day. It appears to have been an anointed recommendation. I was recommended for, I was accepted for doctoral studies financed by an Anglican presbyter in an Anglican seminary at Oxford on the recommendation of a St. Thomas Evangelical Church of India presbyter. What a rare privilege for an unknown Indian Pentecostal. Hallelujah. Perhaps no one else from the UESI or Stacy received that blessing. Achen used to introduce me as a marumon of Stacy because my wife Carol happens to be the granddaughter of Tekati Lachin Umayatigada, who was one of the first presbyters who formed the Stacy. Achin was transparent about himself, his agonies as a father, his anguish about the church, his anger about violence done to women and the vulnerable and the many. We have seen him hurting and wounded. We have been reprimanded and chastened. He was the voice of God and a pattern for denying the self for the greater good, challenging from the pulpit as if he were made of steel and yet being known in real life as a jar of clay. This unfortunately is not the pattern we find today. Rather than being transparent, leaders are presented as if they are decorated for a wax museum made to order by cosmetic surgeons, assisted by the best of artificial intelligence. Strong indeed is the temptation to narrate our stories as benefiting the American dream rather than as shaped by Jesus. And the attempt to fashion Jesus into our models is never ending. These fit more into our cultural wax museums than portray the Jesus revealed in the New Testament. As a beneficiary of Achan's pastoral care and trust, impacted by his message and ministry, I wish to reflect on the self-revelations of Paul found in 2 Corinthians. The letter is replete with debates about authenticity of being a leader who role models the ideal or the community standards. The debate about apostolic authenticity is invariably a debate about the marks of a genuine Christ follower. When there are conflicting viewpoints about the nature of authentic ministry, how do we decide? The concluding chapter of 2 Corinthians invites the church for a fair assessment of themselves and of Paul. Corinthians were persuaded by subsequent visiting preachers to devalue Paul's commission as an apostle and his narration of the gospel. His physical appearance was weak. His speech did not match up to the Corinthian adoration for ancient rhetoric. He was accused of strategies like mere men, carnal wisdom, unreliable speech and programs. His lack of courage, you know, he was scared of death and he was uh, uh, let down in a basket. These are not... Uh, uh, events, aspects or events in a story when people will clap. In fact, an ancient audience would laugh at such a fellow rather than fighting, being led, you know, running away like, like a fugitive. So he was criticized for his lack of courage or chivalry. His painful journeys were all seen as signs of worldliness or being less than adequate incorporation into the glamour of the resurrection order. Paul borrowed a boots, the style of a fool's speech, to narrate that he was not inferior in any way. Paul's authenticity was located not in himself, but in the fact that Christ lives in him. Having made his self-defense, he appeals to the church in chapter 13 and verse 5. Examine if you are standing in faith. Do you realize that Christ lives in you? Paul then appeals that they also be charitable in the assessment. You are looking at outward appearances. 
If anyone is confident that he belongs to Christ, he should reflect on this again. Just as he himself belongs to Christ, so too do we. He prays that they would pass the test if conducted in all integrity. Even if he may have failed in their assessment, Paul desires that they would be fully qualified, that even when he is weak, they may be strong. What then were the criteria of authenticity of being a Christ follower or a minister of Christ in the self-examination? Searching through 2 Corinthians, we can identify several suggestions that are theological, both hardcore and practical theology. It is difficult to divorce one from the other, yet let me attempt such a taxonomy for the sake of clarity. Three three points from what I would label as practical theological criteria of authenticity. First, it's a question, are you exiled or restored? Paul fears for the Corinthians of failing the test, for I'm afraid, chapter 12, verses 20 to 21, for I'm afraid that somehow when I come, I will not find you what I wish, and you will find me not what you wish. I am afraid that somehow there may be quarreling, jealousy, intense anger, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. Look, Paul was not, you know, writing the biography of, of some Bible college somewhere in India. He is writing about a local church back then. I am afraid that when I come again, my God may humiliate me before you. And I will grieve for many of, the, of those who previously sinned and have not repented of the impurity, sexual immorality, and licentiousness that they have practiced. In a nutshell, the community that is called to participate in the new exodus, to be God's temple, to be God's people, God's family, have refused to hear the call. Go back to chapter 6, verses 14 to 7, 1. They are unwilling to move their tents from the territory of the exile in sin to the restored covenant and communion to be located in the Messiah. That point I have borrowed from Bishop N.T. Wright. The fear of God and the desire of God is the second practical theological uh, uh, decide to please God is a second practical theological point I want to highlight. In chapter 4 of, and verse 5, he says, For we do not proclaim ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and, yourself, and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. Permit me to say, Chandrapalli, I didn't like this impression of, you know, being the slave. I'll tell a story which is not recorded here. It was 1980 December. Dr. Steven's daughter Sandra's marriage was being solemnized in Jehovah Shama. Achin was invited to be to give the marriage uh, the, the message. He came fully dressed as a as a presbyter of St. Thomas Evangelical Church. The elders of the of Jehovah Shama wouldn't allow him to deliver the message because he was wearing a cassock and a girdle. Dr. Stevens found it very difficult, but the elders, you know, Jehovah Shama, they are very strict. They were, they were very strict those days. So, some of us, Achen's, uh, you know, fans got around him, and we kept him company when the service was going on <laughs> in, in, the, in the main hall. I was a young staff worker, and I said, but according to your own principle, becoming a Jew to the Jew and Gentile to the Gentile, why did you have to wear this dress? Could he not come in your dhoti and kurta? Achin took up his girdle. And he said, do you know what this means? He said, it's a black robe. This is a servant, a slave goddess. I am bound to Jesus and to that girl. I had no breath for a few seconds. This is a slave's girdle, and I am bound to Jesus and to his church. So that phrase, <laughs> that I am your slaves for Christ, is actually 
the heartbeat of Chanda Achen. That's why I, I, I took the deviation. Proclamation of Christ as Lord calls for a reorientation of the community's life. The Messiah, the Son of God, who is the image of God, on whose face the glory of God is revealed, he is like Adam, both the prototype of what it means to be human, inasmuch as he reflects the invisible God. He is a figure like the Son of Man in Daniel 7, to whom all judgment is given. The gospel of God, a God who works in Christ to heal, comfort, restore, forgive, establish the church as God's righteousness, promising resurrection, motivates, motivates a desire to please God. The exaltation of Christ as Lord sets him as a universal judge, and the impartial judgment of Christ instills the fear of God in his servants, and therefore the desire to please God. The third practical theological aspect is the compelling influence of Christ's love. The desire to please God and live in the fear of God is positively stated as being compelled by the love of Christ. Chapter 5 and verse 14. The message of the crucified Messiah is compelling and life-changing. It makes people ecstatic to the degree of being considered crazy. Whether accused of being sober or crazy, life in Christ is lived for Christ and not for the self. Now may I take you through what I call as hardcore theological criteria. For fears that the boastful Corinthians may fall from their pure devotion to Christ by receiving another gospel, another Christ, another spirit, just like Eve was led astray by the serpent, chapter 11. Perhaps the fear expressed here offers some additional criteria that Paul would want the Corinthians to apply in their self-examination. First is again a question. Are you part of the old or new creation? The contrast between old and new creation does not spring from a dualistic worldview that sees the material and physical as less real or as inherently evil, set against the spiritual or the ideological which is good. Paul underlines rather a robust view of creation as the goodness of God expressed in the stories of Genesis 1 and 2. The contrast between the old and the new is from an eschatological sense as contrasted in 2 Corinthians 3, 4 to 18. What do I mean by eschatological? Looking at it from the fulfillment angle, you look at the promise and the fulfillment. A promise is made and end the fulfillment. So looking at the whole of creation and God's future from the fulfillment angle, that's what we mean by eschatological uh, vantage or viewpoint. It functions as the axis on the axis of promise and fulfillment. 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 What is the new? What is new is the climax of the promise of God, even occurring as a climactic event. The refusal to heed the gospel's call to depart from exile, that is what we saw in our practic practical theology section, the refusal to depart from the exile is to reject the gospel of peace. They do not participate in the new creation in Christ. For anyone in Christ is a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come. The God of peace has canceled the trespasses of humanity in Christ. Genesis 3 and compare it with the deception of Eve. He made the Messiah who knew no sin to become sin and entrusted the message of peace with the apostles. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making his plea through us. We plead with you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. It is only in Christ that one becomes the righteousness of God, his reconciliation and new creation. Some reject Paul's message because the God of this age has blinded the eyes of unbelievers from seeing his glory, on the face of, which is on the face of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God. And there are scholars who say the God of this age actually is pointing to the Roman imperial religious system that was planted everywhere, and it has a lot of nuances. If you read it like that, there's a lot of nuances for the land where we live in today. 
Second, the spirit in hearts of flesh or letters on stone tablets. The question is, do they share in the, in, in the spirit of the new covenant? Do they read the written revelation of God with eyes blindfolded, unable to see who Christ is and what God has done through him? The blindfold is removed in the Messiah as they turn to the Lord who is the spirit. These are reflections from chapter 3. They see you on one another's face, the glory of the Lord reflected, and the community's participation in the glory of the Lord. The Spirit is invested in the hearts of believers as a down payment to guarantee their resurrection with Christ. The Spirit promotes endurance in those whose lives share in the sufferings of Christ. Another gospel, another Messiah, another Spirit. What then was his gospel? It is about the faithfulness of a promise-keeping God. All his promises are fulfilled in the story of Jesus, who is the image and the glory of God, the inaugurator of the new covenant. In him, God was making peace and restoration to both Israel and the whole humanity. In him, the new covenant has been established and the spirit is poured out. In him, the reconciled world becomes a holy temple God's family, God's people. Jesus is the Lord, the universal judge before whom all will have to give an account. This Son of God, the yes of God, the image of God, the glory of God, the, spe this peace, the peacemaker is Jesus who was crucified in weakness but lives by the power of God. His death and resurrection make the, make the necessary channel for God's outpouring of the Spirit. The Gospel reveals God as Father, a comforting and merciful Father, as a Father and God of Jesus. He made His Son to suffer sin and death in order to bring life, comfort, peace to humanity. The weakness of Christ was the divine plan to make humanity strong in Him. His poverty, the means to enrich others, his condemnation as a sin-bearer, the means to make others participate in God's righteousness. He died for all, so that as new creation, all will have life. They that live will not live for themselves, but for him who died for all. Having set, delineated some of the yardsticks, let's look at Paul's own confidence as he appeals to the church. Paul saw his life as being led by God in a victory march. Chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. Paul was a captive on display. He was not leading the march. He was not a conquering general. He was like some of the, one of the dis display pieces, as someone conquered. His arrest and enslavement demonstrates the glory of Christ. Christ is the victor. He is the general who has conquered, and Paul is the slave on display. And yet as a slave, he is the aroma of Christ as a captive, not as a conqueror. His apostolic voyages are indeed paved with all kinds of suffering, humiliation, poverty, shame, weakness, as ridiculed and rejected as the way of Christ. By trekking, by trekking the Via Dolorosa, Paul participates in the story of a meek, weak, suffering, dying, crucified Messiah. He bears the death of Christ so that the, so that the life of Christ may be ministered to the church. I quote, always carrying around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our body. For we who are alive are constantly being handed over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our mortal body. As a result, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. In critical sections of self-defense against the caricatures of his ministry, Paul narrates his own share in the suffering, sufferings of the Messiah. And these are summarized in chapter 13 and verse 4. Paul uses death in these letters as a metonymy, spelling correction, as a metonymy 
for his suffering. It, it is a, a, a figure of speech. Metonymy means a part which stands for the whole, like the crown, the crown jewels or the crown land. The crown stands for the queen or for the king. So a, a part which stands for the finger of God. The finger stands for God himself. A, a, a part standing for the whole. So death functions as a metonymy for his sufferings. Death is the crown of his suffering. Christ lived in Paul through his spirit, generating endurance and faith in the thick of suffering. This living presence, the manifestation of the death of Christ, made him an agent of the gospel's blessings. Please, please listen again. <laughs> It is not as a substitute of Christ. Paul's suffering, ministering life to others, does not become a substitute for Christ. He is an agent. But what, what is he saying? But as Christ himself lives in Paul, enabling him, producing the authenticity of Paul's commission as an apostle, lies in this journey. Paul is enabled to be a participant in the story of Jesus. His life is embedded in the story of the Messiah, who was meek and gentle and led to the slaughter like Isaiah's servant. I'll pause here for a minute. I don't know what is the syllabus here of New Testament studies in your seminary, but if you follow the higher critical school, you would have learned, some teacher in the New Testament department would have introduced to, to the Bultmanian way of thinking where 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 is uh, very important. We once knew Christ according to the flesh. We no longer consider him that way. And we establish a very radical uh, position wherein Paul had nothing to do with the Jesus of history. It is only what was preached and proclaimed by the church or revealed through the spirit that is important. So Christ of faith versus Jesus of history. The last 30 years, a lot of scholarly reaction has taken against this. The Scandinavian school has been very helpful. One of my own teachers, Dr. David Venom, published a monograph on this, and there have been several, several studies. But most of them concentrate on the Thessalonian epistles, Romans, Galatians, and 1 Corinthians. This scholar, Carl Yong Lim, has published a monograph Rooting, arguing from 2 Corinthians how the entire story of Jesus is relived by Paul. So showing a greater continuity or knowledge between the historical Jesus traditions and, and Paul. Uh, a few weeks back I had an interview with Dr. Venom and he said he's writing a new article on how the story of Jesus or the Matthian tradition is carried on in the letters of Paul. Only for those of you who are interested in, you know, producing a thesis or something like that, these are some, some, some stray thoughts for you to explore. Fine. So Karyong Lim's point is this. Paul's life is embedded in the story of the Messiah who was meek, gentle, and led to the slaughter like Isaiah's servant. Authenticity of Paul, when it is challenged, he would see it as deriving from the participation in the story or conformity to the story. In the last 20 plus years, scholars have popularized another phrase, cruciformity, conformity to Jesus, he is now explained by Pauline scholars, particularly as Scott McKnight and uh, uh, Haferman, etc., as cruciformity as a pattern of discipleship. Apostolic authenticity lies in being prototypes of the messianic way of life. I will explain it at the end. Paul's identification with the story of Jesus is re-emphasized in the contrast of chapter 6, verses 8 to 9. Through glory and dishonor, through slander and praise, regarded as imposters yet true, as unknown yet well-known, as dying and yet see, we continue to live as those who are scourged and yet not executed, as sorrowful but always re rejoicing, as poor but making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. 
he was not commenting on the life of Reverend Chandapilla. This is Paul's own narration about his apostolic struggles. Paul would summarize the gospel as the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, who though he was rich, yet for our sakes became poor, so that we might, be so that we might become rich in him. Chapter 8 and verse 9. This pattern was followed by Paul, who did not become a financial burden for the church. In fact, in writing the Second Thessalonians, he would say, we work to support your needs. Paul was poor and yet made others rich. His Macedonian churches caught this vision and emulated it. Look at the opening verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. In calling the church to apply criteria that befit the, befits the gospel, the pattern of the Messiah, the character of God and the, and the Spirit, Paul has demonstrated that this unique way of Christ is the authentic way. Let me submit here, for, here the following for your consideration. I have not written it like this, but when I revise it and submit the paper for your records, I will have it put like this. What I am trying to say in here is, you know, one of Chanda Achen's major thrust and contribution to UESI was the challenge to deny ourselves, take up the cross, and follow Jesus. James now would have preached this how many times? I don't know. <laughs> oh, his whole lifetime. lifetime. All the UESI staff workers were mentored by Chanda Achen to preach this. If you consider your life as of any value, it has no value. But if you pour out your life, for Christ, for the gospel, for the kingdom. Then you will find life. See, Mark's gospel, Jesus' teaching to the twelve, after Paul Peter's confession on the, or in Caesarea Philippi, and on the road to, to Jerusalem. From Caesarea Philippi, if you look at Luke, Jesus is on a journey, his final journey, towards Jerusalem, and he set his face to fulfill the 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 path that God has designed for him or is approaching the cross. That's when he said, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Luke would say, take up his cross daily and follow me, every day. So, what I'm trying to say is, that call was a call Jesus gave disciples and said, you follow me. I'm on the way to the cross. You follow me. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And Paul is precisely saying that. He can apply it to baptism. In Romans, in Romans chapter 6, he can apply it to our union with Christ, baptismal or faith or spirit. In Galatians chapter, chapter 2, chapter 5, and chapter 6, crucified with Christ. But he is applying that journey motif. The journey from Damascus Road to Jerusalem, Paul is applying and saying, our calling to be a disciple or a minister is to walk with Jesus on this road, carrying in our bodies the very death of Jesus. And when we participate in the sufferings of, of Jesus, we truly become or we participate in the story of God or in the, in, in, in the gospel of Christ, and that is our authenticity. Paul relives and applies the call issued by Jesus to the twelve on the road to Jerusalem as a primary criterion of following Christ, and especially of a bona fide call to apostolicity. The call to follow Jesus on the way to Golgotha, bearing our own crosses, is issued by Jesus since the confession of Peter that Jesus is the Messiah, Paul's narrations of his apostolic authenticity is that he has been walking by faith on that same way embedded in the story of Jesus. Paul's Damascus Road experience mapped such a route for him. In Galatians 1.17 we read like this, that God may reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. That God may reveal his son in Paul even as he is engaged in the evangelization of all the nations. Most of our traditional translations would have it in a different way. When God was pleased to reveal his son to me, that I may 
preach him among the Gentiles, among the nations. Now the phrase, to reveal his son to me, is a bold translation. And in that context it fits well. But literally it can be translated also as this, in this way, when God was pleased to reveal his son in me. The NET takes that translation, ESV takes the other translation. But if you look at ESV and NET, both will give the alternate reading in the footnote. So when God was pleased to reveal his son to me, or in me, when God chose Paul to be a location, an arena, where the son of God will be manifested to the world. Now you listen to what Chandrapalachin said. I don't think he ever struggled with the grammatical issue here, but that was the way God's spirit was guiding him. The message goes before the man. You are your advertisement. You are the message. You hear it? So this is the connect. Someone, you know, Chanda Achen, I believe was in his reflections and medi meditations of seeking to follow Jesus, was very much following a track that Paul thought was the track of authenticity. The rejection, you know, point C, the rejection of the way of the cross by some super apostles was a deviation from the authentic gospel of Jesus, the Son of God, crucified and risen, appointed to come again as a judge of all. The way of the cross enables one to participate as a divine agent in as much as Christ is revealed in the human agent. Servants of Christ become Christophanies in their contemporary setting. Authentic Christian ministry, therefore, is a call to be the embodiment and the location, the bearer of both the gospel and the triune God or the gospel. When Paul says, we bear in our body the very death of Christ, that life may be ministered to you, he was precisely telling us this, authenticity comes by becoming a revelation of God, to be habited by God. We, are, we, we, we know the language, Christ lives in me. We know the language, the spirit in us. We also know the promise of this mutual indwelling in John's gospel. I in you, you in me, my father in you, this I'll send a, another comforter, an advocate who will be in you, you in me, I in you, the father, son and the spirit in you. So this is very much Jesus' language. But for Paul, that indwelling, to make us the temple of God, the residence of God, is for a Christophany, for the purpose of revealing Christ to the nations. So authentic Christian ministry, therefore, is a call to be the embodiment and the location, the bearer of both the gospel and the triune God of the gospel. Such genuine ministers become prototypes or standard bearers of the gospel. I'm not looking at an individual, but a trend in my last next statement. All flashy, contemporaneous patterns of the successful, the glamorous, and the powerful are models of corporate leadership which is alien to Christ. I will repeat, all flashy, contemporaneous patterns of the successful, the glamorous, and the powerful are models from the corporate world and these are alien to Christ. In conclusion, and so in the late Reverend P.T. Chandapilla, generations of university students and graduates have seen a life of approximation to standards of authenticity set by Paul in 2 Corinthians. I got this phrase when Chandapilla Chin was speaking at the Spiritual Life Renewal Seminar in 1976 in, in UBS Yavatmal. He was speaking on the temptations of Jesus for a week. And then this was a challenge. There is a standard and there is your life. Our calling is aided by the Spirit to be approximated to be closer, students of, you know, high school or uh, 
junior school mathematics will know what is approximate value isn't it our our challenge is to be approximated to the standard of god of the lord jesus and that is the criteria of authenticity the slaves of the slaves led by god in christ victory march displayed in the displaying the weakness revealed that christ is in them the captured the bearing of the cross daily to follow christ has become the hallmark of belonging to the messiah all experiences of power signs and wonders authority ecstasies knowledge etc need to stand in queue to be validated by their being embedded in the weakness of christ the death of christ power to endure pain endure pain demonstrates the presence of the transcendent in jars of clay as in the theophany or the burning bush or the bush that did not perish in the scorching flame god makes the miseries and afflictions of christ's followers and their leaders to be christophanies the revelation of the glory of the messiah in whom god dwells in perfection paul reflects on the revelation of the glory of god given to moses and particularly on chapter exodus chapters 32 and 34 in in composing chapters 3 and 4 of of second corinthians that's a very well established uh, scholarly position read any standard commentary you will get that view point and how that connects with uh, the jesus as transfiguration narrative that is a phd thesis argued by our own friend from sri lanka dr danny moses published monograph you will get all those what i am trying to say is but scholars have missed out this particular aspect there is the call of moses of course moses of glory etc is there but the original call of moses was with a startling phenomenon unusual there was a fire a bush on fire you see everywhere but a bush remaining green in great fire is an unnatural phenomenon so th- that's how god calls moses's attention isn't it exodus chapter 3 now come back i am trying to suggest to you that is a powerful symbol of apostolic and christian authenticity what does it say it may have lot of other meanings in old testament i am not a great old, old testament scholar you can ask uh, your achens and other teachers to explain it i am suggesting this a fire bush or a bush on fire but it doesn't burn is for the syrian orthodox tradition a symbol of the ver- perpetual virginity of mary their imagination is great it can be a, a symbol of the you know, jesus as perfectly human and divine wonderful it could point to israel's story in pharaoh's uh, slavery it is the lord who preserved them fine it can point to the future of israel that in the fiery journey of the desert god will keep them nourished so all as explanations of yahweh i am that i am i will be that i will be uh, you know all all kind all these are possible i i am not able to explain that further but i want to make a humble suggestion that gives us a picture of authentic christian existence the fire the sufferings the afflictions but kept green within that is the revelation of god as it was to moses and for us today it is a god is giving us the privilege to become a revelation of jesus christ the crucified and risen one to be a bearer of the gospel and a bearer of the truth of the triune god last may i say most of these things are true to the stories of chandrapulachan 
you heard reflections from James Anna, who knew him for many years. You heard from John Mathai, uh, who knew him for maybe for, now, now, I mean, 30, 30, 35 plus years when, in, the, in his life. Uh, mine is much marginal, and you saw that wonderful uh, presentation about Achen's life. And I'm trying to say that when I look at Achen's life, there is a lot of approximation of this to the story of Jesus and how Paul taught his churches to, to live new creation life uh, through the gospel. Now, what am I trying to say? I am not appealing to Stacy to canonize Chandrapulla Achen and make JMBC a center of pilgrimage. You may do it if you want to make money from other religions also. I'm not appealing to you to do that, but rather his chosen lifestyle of simplicity, poverty, and self-denial were conscious choices attempting to paint portraits of the gospel. Chanda, above all else, has shown that God invests his treasures in jars of clay. Even his own perfect embodiment and image was a jar of clay, that is Jesus, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief and suffering. Reflections about such vessels that bear the gospel or to lead the church everywhere to worship, to bless God and to give thanks to God. God be praised. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Idicharya Nainan for the lecture. Now I invite Mr. Jacob Burgess, General Secretary Designate of UESI, to come and give the response to the lecture. It's a humbling experience to be with you all this morning. Respected Prakash Achen, our principal Achen, Jim Achen, Achen seated over here. Reverend Edichai Nainan, I call him Edichai, or we as family, and many of us call him as Edichai. Prasad Achen, James Hinnan, others, dignitaries, student friends, and faculty members of Stacy or JMBC. It's a great privilege, and I count this as an honor to stand here and to share or to respond to what have been presented here. I also would like to confess as a start that among all who have been seated, I thought Prakashachan is my contemporary who may not have that connection with Chanapalachan, but I got failed in that, knowing that he could serve him in the last few days of his life. I am a person who is like many of the, most of the audience who is sitting here, I am like one among you. A person who have not seen Achan, Chandrapilla Achan, or Reverend Chandrapilla, Piti Chandrapilla, but a person whom I have heard through books. I have read through books, through audio cassettes. Most important of all for me, which makes interesting is the life that I could see of, the life that I could see in his contemporaries. Little while before, we heard people saying here, Brother John Mathai, I want to tell you that I have been looking to meet you for almost two decades. I have only heard when I was in Himachal Pradesh and Rajasthan. James Hennan was the one who trained me up. When I joined as a uh, staff worker, he was a uh, general secretary. And what he said was authenticated today again, that it was nothing but how Reverend Chandrapal Achan have impacted his life, influenced him, and he passed it on to the next generation. Idichiri Nayanachan Achan, who spoke here, Many of us know him as scholar. We as family know him as a very man of personal. And as when I present the response, that would come here. A man in whom we saw the blend of scholarship, 
yet person going an extra mile in loving and caring. Let me not mince one uh, incident to bring it to your attention. Just now we heard a beautiful scholarly paper presented here. Jesse, my wife and I were in NGC, National Graduates Conference of USI in Nagpur. Jesse had a boil in her leg. I'm, I'm not very sure if uh, Jan remembers that incident. Jesse was very much in pain, yet she was trying to control and she was with all of us. Edichan looked at her and walked up to us and asked the first question, what is it that paining you? We never shared about this. But what I would like to communicate to you is that, that it is not that just a scholarship, but the person, the care of people to know and recognize their need was something that was always ahead of them. So that's how I see Piti Chandrapala Achen in them. Prasad Achen is here, a person who was my own senior, my own elder, and who have helped me to walk in leadership lifestyle. Of course, Bishop C.V. Matthew as well, who was a bishop of here. There was a time when I was leaving, I almost decided to leave USI and even full-time ministry. But our discussion from 10 p.m. in the night over a cup of coffee, not over a cup of coffee, for a cup, over a cup of coffees, till morning 4 o'clock, he changed all my idea about Christian service and mission, and I continue to hear. So all glory to God and so on. So that's something that I have seen. So my association with Chandapilachan is with my seniors, my elders who are seated here and some of them who are not here. And I see them Im imbibing or walking in some of those footsteps, authenticates what P.T. Chandra Pilatan spoke about, what P.T. Chandra Pilatan lived for. Hence, as a response, I have left with very few things to say because it is very clear what it is. One of the books that I have used for my own reading is The Master Trainer by Pilatan. I think it, this book should be available in this library or bookstall. If not, you can contact me. I have left 14 books with uh, Uday Sir. You can collect it from, or Bharti Mem, you can collect it from them. Now, I have titled my response as a man being intentional. A man being intentional. Now, why I chose this word was, this word was not very familiar to me maybe five or seven years, till seven years back. But in during the reading of my gospel, the reading of the gospel and the Paul narrations when he writes down, I found that this was something which was very, uh, very, very strong in their theology, very strong in their understanding. And they became intentional in what they were believing and in what they were convinced about. As a result of being that intentional decision to love Lord and take up the cross, they followed and that authenticated that. And today we read them, today we study them, and today we follow that. Hence, as we remember, as a response to the paper that has been presented, let us remember that we are speaking about a person who was intentional in his being and in his doing. Intentional in his faith system. He decided to depend on God, and something that has been repeated in this presentation and even about the video that we saw, that he knew who his God was. He knew what his God could do for him. And he, that authenticated to him as each day he lived on. So for him, Choose, choosing the life of suffering, choosing, choosing the life of simplicity was an intentional, and as Siddhi Chan presents it, it was a conscious choice made within himself to see that I follow Christ, the way of the cross. So where the way of the cross could have been denied and the other ways would have elevated him, but he would have rejected the way of cross and invariably he would have rejected the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ, which we didn't do. So the first challenge that comes to us as we read this paper and think about Peter Chandrapalachan is that 
some of us who are getting trained to go out to minister is authenticating the life of our Lord Jesus Christ and living that in our day-to-day -day experience. As I read this book, it comes to me saying that Achan lived this life every day because he knew in whom he believed. Not just in his being, in his belief, but also in his praxis. Because he believed what is written in the word is to be practiced and not to be adorned as a decorative something in the showcase, but something that you need to be worn, but something that need to be practiced at the workplace, among the colleagues, even to the church and the mission at large. He was intentional to ensure that he would choose discomfort in place of comfort and in places of conveniences. In other words, he had enough reasons to continue in Saudi Arabia to, so that he will be able to stand himself and support himself and to move forward in life. But the call was so compelling in him that he chose to get back to India and join along with the people who are suffering. Another thing that we see is that our God is the God who is on the side of the suffering, the oppressed. And we see that Chandrapalachan doing the same thing. He was not captivated by the whims and whips of life and the life of, but he was captivated by the simple life of our Lord Jesus Christ and then as Edichan said about the life of Paul. He knew that that has invited suffering and cross in his life, yet he did not shun away. And this gave authenticity to his own life and gave him audacity to speak with power, speak with authority, speak with conviction, and speak with moving tone so that people will be able to hear God's voice directly coming to him. One of the questions that I ask in USI and even to many of the churches that, what does it stop our church, our movement, to continue in the same passion that we have started off? It is that we miss the voice of God. And Peter Chandler Plachan could authenticate, or his life was authenticated by the way he lived and he spoke. And I believe that that same thing we will continue as we take on the next generation. He was intentional in learning and teaching. For him, learning was not a classroom setting. Rather, his learning was a day-to-day -day or throughout the day life. And as we see in Edichan's paper, one of the significant things that he brought is that the life of Christ and the life of Paul, he did not just leave it aside, rather he took it as a learning point and every moment of his life, he shaped his life in those teachings. And those teachings he exemplified here in our, among us. In other words, he chose the path of incarnation so that he will incarnate and he will be able to help us to understand what he's speaking and talking about. Last, not the least, let me just put it in this way. Before I conclude, he was intentional in relationship. One of the things that I struggle in uh, my walk in this ministry, in Christian ministry is, many times we see two different uh, directions. Either we are so official and so organized and so structural that we are least connected with the people. Or we are so deeply connected with the people that we have missed out through the organizational. In the last few, few weeks, I could talk to a couple of people to whom P.T. Chandaplachan was closely associated. One of them is one of our seniors and elders in USI. His name is Brother A.G. Augustine. He told me that, Jacob, it is very difficult to forget him. You know, you see him in the morning and his words, his actions, and in the night, his actions will also come in your dream also. So I got him there. So he said that, okay, let me just tell you how it is. He said once uh, they were thinking of buying a property for USI, that is 10 Millers Road, the 19 Millers Road now. He says that they had this idea and A.J. Augustine Annan went and told him, he looked, he says that 
Chandrapalachan looked at him in such a way that he knew what was the answer. He said, I didn't wait for the next word, I got up from there. So he says that because Achin very firmly believed that excessive possession, poss possessions, properties, positions will deviate and move you out from the call that God has given you. But A.J. Kastinana was very much convinced that no, USA should have a property. And USA should have something. In fact, I am told that Achin even did not like the telephones. He didn't want the phone to be in the office or in his uh, house, home. Now, it so happened that uh, they prayed. Few of them prayed together. They didn't know what to do. They went to uh, Dr. Nambudripad, who was in CMC Vellore. Dr. Nambudripad was fully convinced that we need to have an office. But they didn't know what to do. On one side is Nambodripad, uh, Dr. Nambodripad who said, yes, we need it. On the other side, Chandrapalachan said that, I think we need to be on tents. We will keep moving. But as they prayed, they, they saw something in Professor Echinok. They went and spoke to them. And we see that Professor Enoch went and spoke to Chandrapalachan. And A.J. Anand said, my eyes were filled with tears when I saw a fiery, a fear, ferocious person willing to listen to somebody elder and speaking to him. And he said, Chanda, I think these people are right. And A.J. Agustin, and then filled with tears, he said, it moved me and I could see a man who is out of God's own heart. What a story. After that, time passed by. There was another story which comes in where it says that Chandrapalachan, now just now James and said how Elena said about the vegetables. In a meeting, there were a lot of people sitting here, there. After Chandrapalachan spoke, he did not stay on the desk. He directly went to the A.J. Agustinan and, and asked him about some of the things that he was struggling with. He said he man who could connect with the word and the world together. A man who could bring it together and to show that we are people or we are men and women of God belonging to each other. As, as we conclude, as I conclude, I would like to give you th two takeaways as we go from here. In response to Achan's paper, we are the new generation of people going to take this message out. Number one, let there be an authenticate life. A life hidden in Christ Jesus. Let us be genuine followers of Christ and not pretentive people in this world. Chandrapalachan's one of the words that he constantly uses in this book is a transparent life. A leader cannot be a person who is not transparent. You know, a life that is not used as decoration, but becoming the voice of God. Second, a life that is ordered with Christ-likeness in speech and in action. I'm sure that the Lord will help us. And what will happen is our convictions will give us confidence and courage to live in this world. Our convictions and confidence will give us authenticity or will give us or authenticate of what we believe and what we preach. Hence, we will have the audacity to say, imitate me because I imitate Christ Jesus. May God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob Burgess, uncle. Now, let us take some moments to Share any questions or comments that we have based on the lecture that we heard. The time is open now to the floor to give your comments and questions. The cordless mic can be brought. Students, faculty, guests, all are welcome.
Thank you, uh, Dr. Idichiriya, for that uh, powerful, very powerful, very moving paper. I just want to pick up and highlight two words uh, from your paper, which, uh, according to what I understood, uh, will uh, carry the whole thing. Uh, one is uh, cruciformity, and the other one was um, uh, Christ Christophany. You know, be being confirmed to Christ in the cross and Christ being revealed in us, or being the world seeing. This is exactly, I think, uh, what Sandra Prelation's life was about. I also want to say this that uh, to everybody that uh, when we listen to this whole thing, it is a quite a powerful, theologically sound, uh, deeply insightful paper that we read. But as it usually happens in theological uh, discussions, papers become very scholarly, academic, and with, receive a lot of applause. But uh, here I think it goes to another level where uh, it should transform each of us. So it's not just a paper that uh, is meant for uh, just academic scholarship, but it's also inviting us to a commitment in our life, a commitment to be uh, cruciform, you know, whatever you say, to be confirming uh, to, the, uh, to the image of Christ in the cross, to bear the cross and to bear Christ. And then uh, Christopher, they let the world see that Christ is in you. So thank you very much for that presentation. It has really moved me, very touched. I'm very emotionally moved after listening to all of that. Also, all the testimonies about uh, Peti Chandra Pulachan. For the younger generation, this may be just a lot of stories. But uh, for, uh, I think, just as it was for many of us who knew him, it was not just uh, theory, but it was something that transformed our life very much. But a man who was down to earth, maybe if you permit me, I'll just tell a small story uh, and uh, conclude. You know, when uh, in the same way that Chandrapulachan was speaking at the uh, spiritual uh, renewal meeting in UBS when I was a student, Edi Charyas was senior, much senior to me. But that year again, uh, it was in 80, I think 1980. And um, he, Chand Chandrapulachan knew that I am from the evangelical church. He asked, you know, after the meeting, evening, he said, come, let's go for a walk. And he took me uh, in the Yavatmal campus. Near that, there was some lane in between some paddy fields or something. So we were walking through a small lane, both sides, barbed fences. So he was just asking me all about what I am and what do you want and all of that. So then he asked me one question. I want to ask you one question. What is your greatest goal in life? You know, I was already in EU for a number of years as a student and all. So I was so passionate about reaching out to people in North India. I studied in North India. I told him, Achan, my greatest goal is to do whatever is within my ability, the best, to evangelize India. So we were just walking together. Achan immediately stopped, came in front of me, stood opposite to me, as if you stop. He faced me and pointed his fingers at me and said like this, you are wrong. You are wrong. I was so shocked. I thought I was telling him something he will be very excited about. You know, that I want to do my best for the evangelization of India. He said, you are wrong. Then I asked, Achan, then what else can it be? He said, your greatest goal in life should be to be like Jesus. That summarizes him. And from that moment, everything in my life changed. You know, that one stopping me where I am trying to do great things for Christ. No. Let us be confirmed with Christ. And I was thinking of all of that. Thank you. And uh, we are very much moved. Let us not depart from him here with some kind of knowledge. But, and not even entertained by some stories. But be with a commitment to follow that example, the invitation that we received to be, to how, you know, to be confirmed to the cross and to let the world see Christ's beauty in us. Thank you.
I'm so thankful to God. And the, every year I have been listening <coughs> lecture on Chandrapala, P.T. Chandrapala Chan's uh, days. And uh, every time when I hear uh, the lecture, and there were some questions where it was answered and clarified. And today I was uh, listening on the, the paper which was presented on the basis of say, um, book, um, <coughs> Epistle to uh, Corinthians. And uh, when we apply this to the present scenario of uh, Christian leadership, is it being followed by the Christian leadership in the present uh, Christendom and especially in the uh, leadership scenario? And because many of you have you had close contact with the um, P.T. Chandrapalachan and you have shared your memories and the way and the lifestyle that you have watched from him. So what do you see now? Is it, is it shocking you? Is it breaking you? Or encouraging you? Does it make any sense these days? I do not want to stand in, in a place where Jesus will tell anyone without sin, let him be the first to cast the stone. We are all in some sense, uh, to some degree or the other, compromised. I am not living with the two kurtas. I, since my children started working, they give me very expensive shoes. I do drive a car, it is not my own. A church member once sent a car to my house and I thought he was parking it. And a few days later I, was, I came to understand he was not taking it, he wanted me to drive the car. So I am not like Chandrapalachan riding a bike or uh, sorry, sorry, riding a cycle, uh, you know, I do use an air conditioner in my house when it is. <laughs> so if you say, are you strictly in that way? No, no, I, I must say that, no, not that. Nor am I saying that that is the literal principle or yard, but you find there a pattern. The pattern is what uh, Prakashashin said, making our life's ambition to follow Jesus. Now, all of our lives is to be seen as a journey toward Jesus. It's a pilgrimage. To say that I have achieved, Paul never said in Philippians chapter 3, when he narrates the whole thing, he says, I don't claim that I have achieved it, but I am pressing on towards that. That Christward journey. May I say, some areas where I, some of us can say that. I'm sure all these Achins here uh, and, you know, the mission leaders here have had a lot of opportunities to look for greener pastures. But to say that this is God's calling and I will fulfill the Lord's calling in my life is to be that grain of wheat. To say that I will not, you know, I'm involved in training leaders. There are two institutions where which we run. We have almost... 280 students in training. What, what is their monthly income when they go? If they were to do the Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme and if they were to be employed for 200 working days, they would perhaps earn more than what the church will give them in a North Indian village. So that is, that is the choice to be the grain of wheat. When you can amass wealth Rather than amassing it, and like what Achen has done, you contributed to the development of resources for the church, for the mission. When you develop leaders who are not your 
sons or sons in law you develop leaders from the larger family of god there you are emulating but for all of us it is a challenge it is a journey it's a pilgrimage and we are walking towards christ towards the making the lord as a center and the, uh, uh, and 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 the goal of our life uh, you want to answer there seems to be no further comments and questions let us now move to the time to express thanks on behalf of jmbc and therefore i request the academic dean of jmbc reverend dr jimmy joseph paul to come forward and express the word of thanks respected chairman of uh, this program reverend jacob john maman our principal reverend dr prakash abraham matthew respected reverend dr idicharyan nayanan and uh, mr jacob vargis pastors of different uh, churches and our guests from um, different organizations and the churches my dear faculty colleagues student friends staff of jubilee i greet you all in the matchless name of our lord and savior jesus christ i am standing here to propose the vote of thanks um, and first of all i would like to thank god almighty for enabling us to gather together this um day for this 11th uh, annual lecture annual ptc lecture that is what we call it and secondly i would like to thank our um today's preacher or we can say the presenter of uh, this paper this is the 11th presentation and i still remember the first presentation or the first uh, ptc lecture and uh, those uh, in the first ptc lecture it was um, dr safi ratyal who gave the presentation and it was inaugurated by our then chairman most reverend um, dr cv matthew and um, in the inaugural address he pointed out the purpose of this lecture and the purpose of this ptc lecture is to to hand over or to transfer the the legacy of late very reverend pt chandrapalla to the next generation of jmbc and even to the other uh, colleges or other friends who gather here for this lecture so that was the main purpose of uh, this lecture organizing every year to hand over that legacy and the lifestyle and also you know to to teach the next generation or the the community the present community in jubilee the the lifestyle and uh, the ethos visions and um uh, vision of um, very reverend pt chandrapilla and i can boldly say that reverend idicharyan nayanan today conveyed very clearly the legacy of pt chandrapilla chan through his presentation and also he taught us from the life of chandrapilla chan as well as from the life of apostle paul and through the uh, through the theological reflections that we could listen from the second corinthians thank you um idichayan that we used to call him when we were in uh, syax 
he had a very special concern those days for the Malayali students there. And we even visited his uh, house uh, some occasions, especially when there is a cottage prayer meeting happened in uh, his house. We used to visit there. And we had a wonderful fellowship there. Thank you, um, Lichayan, for um, this wonderful presentation about authentic Christianity. You know, something that is missing today. Who is an authentic Christian in this generation? So, wonderful presentation that we could listen from um, uh, Reverend Dr. Idicharya Nainan. And I would also like to thank um, Reverend Jacob Vargis for your observations and comments contributed to the very purpose of uh, this lecture. And thank you, sir, for uh, the reflections and uh, the response. And I would like to thank this time, our special thanks uh, to Mr. John Mathai and Reverend James Reknaraj for sharing your experiences with very Reverend P.T. Chandapalachan and experiences or life, you know, that we have speaks more than, you know, the words. So when you share about your life experiences, that was, um, that also contributed to the very purpose of this lecture that we could, uh, we could get or we could listen from the life that you had with the very Reverend P.T. Chandapulla. And also, I would like to thank this time our um, principal, Reverend Dr. Prakash Abraham Matthew, for your introductory remarks and um, welcome speech. And I would like to thank um, uh, Reverend Jacob John Maman for, uh, for leading this uh, service. And I would like to thank Reverend Lalboy Hokip for your opening prayer. My special thanks to our dear choir members and a choir for your uh, beautiful hymns. And uh, I'd like to thank the media um, people, media team for the video presentation and also for um, the live telecasting of uh, this program. And I would like to thank the PA system friends uh, for your help. And the different committees are functioning today for this program, the food committee, Physical Arrangement Committee and the Reception Committee. Thank you, uh, advisors and the student friends who are in different uh, committees. And I would like to thank uh, our pastors uh, who are here, Reverend um, uh, Dr. Pr uh, Jonam Prasad, our former uh, principal, Reverend uh, Samuel Ganeshan, Reverend Leslie Nagaraj, and um, is there any other pastors? Uh, K, uh, Reverend K. Raju, uh, our Tamil church uh, pastor, and uh, all others um, who came from different um, uh, parts of um, Chennai, and also our board members and uh, trust members who are here. And uh, I would like to thank all our student friends, faculty friends, staff, and all others who uh, helped us in various ways and also participating in this um, uh, in this lecture. Once again, I give all glory, honor, and praises to God. May God bless all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy Yachin. Till now, we have been reflecting about the life of very Reverend P.T. Chandapilla. And I would like to read the last sentence of this paper, the lecture. Reflections about such vessels that bear the gospel ought to lead the church into worship. We have heard great things about the life of the man of God. He became such a great man of God because he became a slave of God. And this is what we have to carry out after this meeting. Let us trust God that we also would be transformed into slaves of God and that our lives would be reflecting the life of Jesus Christ. At this time, the choir would lead us in the song, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. And let us all stand now and let us truly worship God.
and ask God to guide our lives to indeed be slaves of Jesus Christ so that uh, our lives would be transformed to be the leaders that this nation really wants. I request everyone including the, the media team, the quiet team also to be in a mood of a moment of worship. standing let us have the closing prayer and benediction i invite reverend dr john m prasad director of center for peace studies madras christian college to come forward and lead us in prayer and benediction shall we pray father we come to you as jars of clay or just as clay in the potter's hands. Weak as we are, fragile as we are. But we thank you, Lord, that it has pleased you to reveal thy glory in us who are just jars of clay. We thank you, Lord, for the invitation to let you be filled in us, to let us be in you and you in us. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to each one of us. Thank you for this amazing life of our beloved P.T. Chandra Palachan, the memories of which finds it very stubborn to depart any of us. The inspiration still making waves in this nation and around the world. But we thank you that is true because he tried to let you live in him and he lives in you. Lord, we have a wonderful model before us, but it all begins from you and it all belongs to you. It all means you. Just as Paul invited those who, whom he discipled that you be an imitator of me, as I imitate Christ. Lord, when we remember the life of Chandra Palachan and as we remember this today, our purpose, our intention, our goal is not to canonize him, but to see how you lived in him and it will lead us to worship you. 
a worship that is a complete surrender, a total surrender into your hands, wherein we will be transformed. Thank you, Lord, for being us, with us this morning and for bringing your servant and bringing this very, very powerful presentation before us, which is not just a presentation, but as an invitation to be transformed, to let you live in us. O oh Lord, we pray that you will bless him and his ministry for his family and children and their families, and we thank you for all of that. We thank you for Brother Jacob, and we thank you for his responses today and reminders today. And as he looks forward to taking up new responsibilities as a head of the leader in the UESI ministry, for, of which Chandra Pulachan was the first uh, General Secretary, I pray, O oh Lord, that you will be with him uh, and guide him, give him wisdom and grace that he will continue to pass on the torch, the light, to many others. We thank you for Reverend James Ratnaraj and uh, Mr. John Mathai and all the others who enriched our uh, time together today. Pray that you will bless each one of us as we depart from this place, not thinking much about us, but thinking about you who wants to live in us, thinking about how we will reflect you. Lord, send us with the grace, great desire to be belonging, to belong to you, to let you live in us. Send us with your blessings, your power, your strength, and your grace. That will carry us through in the worst of our life situations, in the weakest of our life. But your strength is made perfect in our weakness. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Now may the love of God the Father, the grace of the Son Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit continue to abide with us and help us to live in Christ and to let Christ live in us this day and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Achan, for closing prayer and benediction. The meeting is over. Now I invite the entire community to take part in our fellowship lunch, which is, uh, shall be held in our dining hall. May God bless us all. Have a blessed day.